All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Publicize webinar with former TechCrunch senior editor and 500 Startups venture partner Ryan Lawler. Ryan has been a writing for, about technology for over a decade at publications like Light Reading, GigaOM, and TechCrunch. His most recent career turn led him to the venture capital space, where he worked as a venture partner at 500 Startups, sourcing deals and recruiting startups for the Accelerator. Ryan is also the host of The Ratchet, a great new podcast that delves into the people side of tech with interviews of interesting tech professionals. I've included a link in the info tab of this webinar, and I highly encourage everyone to take a listen. Uh, in organizing this webinar, Ryan told me that one of his favorite parts about being a tech, at TechCrunch was covering product launches, and he mentioned that sometimes he would gain access to products before they were 100% complete which struck me as very interesting. That's why today we've decided to talk to Ryan, the product launch aficionado, to get his take on how companies should strategize product launches with the media. After our conversation, we'll have a time for questions from the audience, so please write them in the questions and topics tab, uh, or you can also put them in the chat section to the right. A uh, recording of this webinar will also be available on the Team Publicize YouTube channel in the coming days. So Ryan, um, thank you very much uh, for taking the time and being here with us today from San Francisco. Sure, thanks for having me. Um, so like I was, I, I, like I was saying um, in, the, in the intro, uh, you had mentioned that product launches were uh, one of your favorite parts about working for TechCrunch, and I was wondering if maybe you can start off by explaining that. Sure, yeah, I, I would say that, you know, a lot of what I enjoyed about writing about technology um, and getting exposure to new uh, apps, new services, just new, cool new gadgets, uh, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And really, you know, being able to go deep on, you know, how much I enjoyed them or whatever. Um, basically, a lot of the times, you know, the things that I wrote about were products that I personally enjoyed products that I personally used. Um, and so, you know, the advice or one of the things that we were talking about seems kind of counterintuitive. Um, people always want to have their products 100% ready before they sort of show them to the world or before they, you know, launch them um, officially in a tech blog or um, online. Uh, but, um, a lot of times I feel like that can, you know, that doesn't give, uh, the tech press ample time to actually, um, live with a product, um, to get to know it, to sort of, um, play with all of the little wrinkles, um, and, you know, really have an intimate understanding of, you know, what the product does and what the potential market is for it. Um, so as we were talking about early on, um, you know, I suggest that uh, the products, some of the products that I really, really enjoyed um, writing about were those that I had used for several months before I actually even got a chance to write about it. Um, so a couple of examples of that. Uh, there was a, you know, health and, um, it was a health and diet app called Rise, um, mm -hmm. which is something that I wrote about several years ago. Um, and I actually got access to a beta version of that for about six months before, you know, it, it was publicly available, uh, on the app store. Um, and so having that sort of exposure to something being able to use it in, in my everyday life and to actually uh, sort of see the results. I, you know, with that particular app, I lost about 20 pounds over the course of that time. And so, you know, I had this positive experience about it uh, or this positive experience with it. And I could really sort of talk about the benefits rather than just, uh, you know, theoretically talking about um, whether or not something like that would work. How how many people in the uh, in the tech space, um, tech journalists, do you think 
uh, take advantage of this and actually um, uh, they do test things out before. Uh, I know people are working on, on deadlines a lot of time as well. Right. So, you know, I, I don't know if you can throw out a percentage or if you, even that makes sense, but is it, is it something that's pretty common? Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's incredibly common, but what, what I would say is, you know, at pretty much every major tech publication, um, you'll have, you know, one or two people who are focused on product reviews. Um, and these are people who kind of specialize in the type of in-depth um, writing about product. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, uh, at The Verge, you know, someone like uh, Casey Newton would um, get access to things uh, ahead of time. Um, Walt Mossberg is the classic example of someone who you know, we'll spend time with a, a product. In the case of uh, major companies like Apple, you know, they, they'll generally allow review units to be in the hands of reporters for a week or so um, before the actual reviews come out. And, you know, it, it, can, it can be tough even with, um, with that time. You're not going to get to know the ins and outs of, of especially a really sophisticated product like a laptop or a phone um, compared to what else is on the market. Um, but when we talk about startups and you know, the products they, they launch, whether they're apps, um, whether they're new services, uh, or you know, even with hardware, um, having some access to to the thing beforehand um, can actually be really helpful. Just curious, did you see any um, difference in interaction um, between you and your readers when you know you had this in-depth access ahead of time and you were more knowledgeable about the product and you can write about it versus when you were doing a company or a, like a product launch right. um, and, and you didn't have that information, you were speaking theoretically? Yeah, well, I think I think basically what it comes down to is the less information you have, um, the uh, harder it is to actually make an informed judgment upon something. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, a good example of this was uh, I heard I actually don't want to talk about the name of the product, but um, it was essentially a calendar app that I had written about a few years ago. And, um, you know, I was pitched on the launch about a week beforehand. Um, I uh, talked to the founders a few days before it was going to, you know, go live. And I really only had a very limited amount of time to play with it myself. And then, you know, with that, I could talk about what the founders were hoping would be the value proposition of the product. Um, mm -hmm but I might not experience it myself, you know? And so the less information you have, um, the harder it is to make a decision. And also, you know, when you talk about the relationship with uh, readers or people who haven't had the same access, um, it's a lot easier for them to be cynical, right? Like until you actually have the magic of, of using a product yourself, um, you know, it's easier to blow it off. I remember I wrote a really, really glowing review of, uh, of an email app called Mailbox, which was pretty innovative uh, at the time. It ended up being acquired by Dropbox and, you know, mm -hmm. eventually shut down. Um, but, you know, at the time it had a lot of um, user interface interactions that were fairly novel and new to the market, um, which like, you know, swiping to archive or to delete, which is a pretty standard uh, thing in most uh, email apps today. But, you know, it, it kind of got started with that one. And I remember writing this really, really glowing review about how great the app was and how it changed my life and how I suddenly became, you know, in inbox zero or for the first time in my life. Um, mm -hmm. And it actually, you know, made things, it actually made my work life easier. Um, and, I, I remember reading some reviews that were like, 
you know, this is just way off the charts um, in terms of like what you're claiming. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think for most people, once they got access to it, they kind of saw like actually how much better of an app it was um, than most of the other clients out there at the time. Uh, that's kind of a good point. How much of a, a risk do you run if you do run um, a product launch announcement with with very little um, uh, very little previous experience with the product? Right. Uh, and and I guess the risk I'm talking about is perhaps losing followers who had once trusted you as a uh, as somebody that could deliver those. Um, Real great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a. It's, I, I don't think that you'll necessarily lose followers, but you definitely lose the trust of your readership. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that you know that's that's part of it as well. Um, when you talk about what should be the benefits of something, um, and you know, frankly, the tech ends up not being that great. Um, you know, I a pretty famous example of this is. Uh, when Apple put out its app, its maps app, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, started doing its own mapping, uh, its own mapping. And, and, you know, ultimately that app was a real piece of shit and no one liked it, but it got such a glowing reception from the press, uh, before they actually got a chance to use it mm -hmm. that everyone looked bad in that situation you know, because they were talking about how great this was supposed to be, it ended up being really horrible. And, um, you know, so, so you do run a risk of talking up the benefits of something without actually using it um, first. Okay. Um, let's shift gears and, and pretend I'm a, uh, a founder and mm -hmm. I'm, building a, I'm building a product. Um, when should I start thinking about the messaging I want to convey to a journalist or what I want to tell them? Well, I think it, I think it depends on what the product is, um, what your long-term vision is versus your short-term vision, mm -hmm. uh, how quickly you expect uh, whatever the product is to get into market. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then how soon you expect, um, you know, new features to be added or whatever, um, you know, the uh, typical advice is, you know, create an MVP, um, get it in front of some users, some beta users, do some testing, do some iteration, um, and, you know, and figure out what works, figure out what doesn't, um, and then move uh, accordingly. Um, while you're doing that iteration, it's really hard to know what's going to work. And so it's really difficult to know, you know, if you should put it in the hands of a journalist, mm -hmm. um, for instance. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest anyone, you know, go to a journalist with like an alpha version of their app that they've never put in front of any actual users. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally speaking, you want to have you know, a test group of, you know, at least a couple dozen, hopefully a couple hundred, um, maybe a couple thousand actual users um, on your product uh, and using your product for a few months before you would go, you know, for a public launch with it. Now, at that, at that point, you know, once you're at the beta version and you can see you know, maybe you're just sort of squashing some bugs. Maybe there are certain features that you expect to add, but you're not quite there yet. Um, maybe you're going to do one last revision on the user experience or the design. Um, you know, at that point, um, you know, trying to find a journalist uh, to get early access to it uh, beforehand so that they can play around with it and, you know, live with it themselves. Like that's something you might want to think about doing. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of feel like, you know, the, the places where a lot of startups fail is they'll have a big splashy launch. You know, they will have been working behind the scenes trying to get something perfect 
um, for three or six or nine months, whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, they have a small group of test users that really love it. Um, and they want to make a big splashy launch and, you know, the hype ends up being what kills them, right? right. Because the expectation is that the product is better than it is. Um, and so that's why I really feel like, you know, getting early user feedback. Um, and listen, when we talk about, when we talk about the quote unquote product specialists at, um, at these publications, um, they can provide valuable feedback as well. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, I've seen it with my former colleagues or with other people um, who have worked for other publications, you know, they will have seen so much that, you know, they can, you know, a lot of them are almost like amateur, like UX designers, right? Where they say, okay, why is this button here? Like, what are you hoping to get the user to do um, by laying the, by laying this out this way, as opposed to some other way, you know, they might even give you advice on like, um, you know, how, how the app might be used or give you a fresh perspective on, you know, how they're using it or what their, um, what their experience has been. Um, so it can be valuable, you know, even from like a user or UX testing, um, testing, uh, I guess, you know, standpoint as well. Right. Actually, that, that kind of jumps ahead to a question that I wanted to ask a little bit further in. But um, I, I think that, you know, there might be a fear um, mm -hmm. that founders have that, hey, if I put this product that is not 100% complete in front of a journalist, there's always that fear that they could, you know, write a scathing review about my product and, and completely bash it. Right. Um, has it. Has it been your experience that perhaps maybe a journalist would just choose not to write about it and provide some constructive feedback um, that the person could do to improve or? Yeah, I mean, you know, my general guideline was that I would never, I wouldn't write about something that I didn't actually feel was something worth writing about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if, if that's the case, then you have another problem. Right, which is if you fail to convince the journalist of, of the value of your product, then you know you might want to think about like whether it's something that you know other people will actually want. Um, mm -hmm. It I think it's rare that people will write scathing reviews of things um, that they've actually had some exposure to, and this goes back to you know the more information the better, right? Like if you actually get a chance to live with the product or to use it, um, then you're, then you can actually have an informed opinion of it. Um, and in my experience, if you have the informed opinion that you don't like the thing, um, you're less likely to write a scathing review and more likely to just not write about it. Right. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, does that kind of go to just like the sheer um, volume of, startups that are trying to get coverage and yeah. so it's like hey like i really don't even have time to write something negative um and also it's not like it's not like they're a built-up company um right. like apple you know where right, people right. kind of tear them down in the media at, at some point but these guys um small startup founders they're just trying to get coverage uh anyway right yeah, um, and, and, you know, it really is just uh, a battle of getting the reporter's attention mm -hmm. um, and getting them to become engaged and getting them to be interested um, because, you know, reporters are receiving um, dozens or hundreds of pitches a day. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, in order to differentiate yourself, you have to provide some value to them. Um, you know, the, the, the products that I enjoyed writing about, I found most of the time were making my life better, um, from a productivity standpoint. So, you know, there were apps that I, I really, really enjoyed. Mailbox is a great example, um, where it actually made my life better. <laughs> you know, it wasn't just a theoretical case of, you know, I could see this working for someone. 
Um, and I think that gets to another point of like trying to find the reporter who will be interested um, is just as important as, you know, um, it's just as important as like finding any reporter to write about it. And I, I, I think that's something that, that can get lost um, mm -hmm. when people are, are pitching certain reporters. Um, there are two things at play. You want, you want to find somebody that has an interest in the type of technology or the type of app that you're putting out there or the type of hardware product that you're putting out there. Um, so you identify you know, the person at each publication that writes about hardware. You identify mm -hmm. the person at each publication that writes about productivity apps. You identify the, the person who uh, is interested in personal finance. You find the person who um, you know, has children and writes, and write about, writes about tools um, to help parents. Um, and so it's really, really important to figure out who those people are and target them um, when you're doing your outreach. And that's a great point. Maybe we could even dive into um, some techniques uh, that you think might be good for identifying that. Right. Um, obviously, I'm not sure how Mailbox approached you, but um, well, it's Mailbox, pretty, yeah, <laughs> the, mailbox the is mailbox an interesting story. Yeah, uh, tell me. Uh, so uh, I actually hunted them down, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Um, uh -huh. You know, I had several people in my network who knew uh, the founding team. Uh, before it was Mailbox, uh, the team had created a, it was actually a productivity to-do app called Orchestra, um, which ended up not being successful. Um, and so once the team started working on, once they identified that that product wasn't going to work, they started working on this other thing, which was email. Um, and so I had a, a lot of people in my network um, that were connected to them and said, you know, you should find out what Gentry is working on. So I reached out several times over the course of, you know, six to nine months, um, just trying to like get on that beta because other people in my network had said, you know, what they're working on is pretty interesting. Um, and then I would say, I guess- were there, I'm sorry, were there other reporters that also were able to test ahead of time? Uh, I think at that point, so, I got on an early version of it, um, and I think it was Ellis Hamburger who was at The Verge at that time. He works for mm -hmm. Snapchat now, um, but uh, again, like on the product marketing side of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I think he got he got access to it. I'm not sure who else. There was only two or three of us that that were able to write about it at launch, mm -hmm. um, and that was a case where I think we actually got the app about a week beforehand. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't as long as I probably would have liked, but it was long enough that it actually made my Changed life, your life. Yeah, <laughs> made my life that much better. <laughs> nice. Okay. Well, um, perhaps if, um, if we don't have the luck of, um, the word of mouth um, right. in Silicon Valley that says, Hey, you have a great product. Um, what are some good ways to identify a journalist and let's let's give the example that um, you know Ryan Lawler wrote about a um, a GPS app um, okay. but maybe you, you wrote about it once you wrote about a funding announcement right. um, does that necessarily mean you like to cover GPS or you're interested in GPS no I mean generally um, you can look through an author page and see what technologies or what areas of focus people have um, you know a lot of people are generalists and so it can become more difficult to identify, you know, what uh, is of interest to them. But generally speaking, I mean, you know, let's let's take finance for an example, right? And so, um, I was really interested in a lot of uh, consumer-facing uh, fintech apps um, when I was at when I was at TechCrunch, and I ended up writing about the launch of one that was uh, it was a company called Digit. And it does automated savings. Um, and so, you know, uh, if, if you see that I'm writing about a competing product or a, a product that, or products that are in the same vertical, um, 
you know, that's something where, you know, just look through somebody's author page. Um, just do a Google search uh, about to see who's writing about um, competing apps or apps in the same vertical. You know, you, if, if you have a startup and, and you're working on a product, chances are you've already identified, um, you know, who your competition is. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, use that information to find out who's writing about those things um, and uh, to try to get in front of those people. The one thing that I will say um, that, again, is kind of counterintuitive is sometimes uh, those people will have, I guess, w what I would call, um, you know, uh, they'll have a certain bias towards something that they found that they liked. So mm -hmm. I wrote about Mailbox, and then I was approached by, you know, I wrote this glowing review, and then I was approached by a dozen other mail apps that said, oh, well, if you like Mailbox, you'll like us better. Um, right. And at that point, you know, I, I, I had this bias towards the app, and so You're already in love. I'm already in love. Already in love. The last thing I want to do <laughs> is move to another email app, break my workflow, mm -hmm. and then, you know, have it make my life less productive. Um, so that, that can be, um, that can be a, a difficulty as you're trying to identify people, depending on, you know, what type of product you have. Yeah, I mean, I, I've spoken with other journalists too. I think Rebecca Grant comes to mind where, um, from VentureBeat, uh, and she had mentioned, you know, like, hey, I just wrote about a productivity app. Like, I don't need to write about another one again. Right. Um, right. So, so you might have just missed the boat with that person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so let's let's go back again. Um, pretend that I'm a, a startup founder and I'm launching a product. But instead of thinking about when should I be giving this product um, to a journalist to take a look at, what about when should I be thinking about my messaging? What sorts of things are important to you about the actual building of the product that you like to include? And then maybe I should note down um, to, to share with a journalist at a later time? Yeah, I mean, I think that most, um, most startups or most founders are doing this, they're doing this sort of intuitively themselves. You know, they're, they're doing their own um, product testing, they're doing their own um, uh, talking to users, or they should be, to find out what the user experience is, whether it's positive or negative, what the sentiment is. Um, and, you know, most founders know why they are creating the products that they are. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the, when you talk about the messaging part, a lot of it is just telling that story. You know, why did you create the app? Like, like what is it that made you decide that this is what you wanted to spend, you know, a, a year of your life on or however mm -hmm. many years of your life on? Um, and so a lot of it is like, answering that question, right? Like you have to have um, the answer for yourself around why this is worth your time. Um, and then you tell that to, you know, you tell that to the reporter. Um, when you talk about, um, you know, uh, it's sort of like intuitively like product, product marketing, right? Like what's your use case? Like how are people using the app? How is it mm -hmm. making their lives better? Um, you know, what benefit have they seen from, you know, being users of whatever app service product that, um, you're putting out there. Um, so it's, when we talk about messaging, I feel like, um, a lot of founders are doing this intuitively. It's just basically like writing those things down, um, and, um, mapping out what the benefits are. What about um, conveying the size of a problem or the gravity of the problem that right. you're trying to solve? How right. important is that? Well, it's important. I mean, you know, again, this, like a lot of that goes to like market sizing, right? Like mm -hmm. a lot of it goes to figuring out like, you know, how this will improve people's lives. How will it improve 
um, the world with like wh whatever the thing is, um, you know, th the founders should have a reason for this. Um, and so at that point, it's basically just like getting that message across. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it does. Um, it does. Thank you. Um, so maybe you could walk us through what you do when you test the product. Um, but what do you do when you first unbox it? Yeah, well, it depends on, it depends on, um, what, what sort of product it is. Um, I mean, you know, if it's, if it's an email or productivity app, like a lot of it basically comes down to, you have to, you know, connect it with whatever your different accounts are to, um, make sure something works. Um, mm -hmm. the, the products that I liked the most were those that um, were actually pretty seamless, right? And so um, I personally hate um, notifications. I think they're a big drag on, on productivity and, and being able to get stuff done. Um, mm -hmm. I turn all of my notifications off. And so, you know, the more seamless um, a user experience is, like the better it is. Um, and, and what I mean by that is for me, like I don't, I don't necessarily want an app to remind me, you know, that it's, that it's working for me. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like I just want to be able to set it and forget it and, and know that it's working and, um, and, and not have to come back to it constantly. Um, so I, I guess, a lot of it comes down to just like hooking up the app into my life and then, you know, playing with it. A lot of it will be just the typical product stuff, like trying to work through what the user experience would be for a typical user. Like mm -hmm. why, why is this button in this place? Why isn't it in another place? Um, going into the settings, going into, you know, um, going into the navigation bar, right. To like figure out where things are. Um, and you know, is that user experience intuitive? Um, is, is there something missing? Is there something that I wish the app or, or product did that it doesn't take care of? Okay. Like, and, uh, if it does that thing, but it's not clear, like, you know, maybe the, maybe the team needs to go back and fix that, right? Like a, a lot of it is just sort of diagnosing, personally like diagnosing like how, how the user is expected to use the app versus, you know, whatever I'm doing. And a lot of that sure. judgment just comes into like, does my expectation for what this thing does match up with my own experience in using the app. So do, is that kind of just like a natural checklist of things that you want to go through? I want to check the user experience, right? Um, I want to check, does it complete what it says it's going to do? Right. And the overall, um, you know, how o overall e easy this is. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, is, or it, is there anything beyond that? Or? Is it, is it dummy proof? Um, and then does it actually work? Does it, you know, like, is super important, yeah. yeah, like, does it actually do the thing that it says it does? Um, a lot of it, I feel like comes down to, is it dummy proof? Right? Like, um, like if, if I download this app and I didn't have any, like four instruction screen showing me how to, how to use this, mm -hmm. would I be able to get value out of it? um, you know, from, you know, from day one. Um, and, and so a lot of it is kind of like that judgment call. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, you never know when you have a new product, like, um, how a user is going to respond to it. Right. Like, unless you've, you've done enough, like user testing or whatever. Um, and so, especially, I don't know, it's kind of interesting, like, especially when you've been working on a certain product or you've been working on a certain, you know, solution or, or service or whatever for so long, 
um, I feel like sometimes founders can take for granted their own knowledge of, um, of how they use the product because mm -hmm. they've been working to solve a singular problem. Um, and sometimes they lose sight of how other people would use it because they weren't there from, you know, day one trying to like build the thing. Right. right? And so going back and doing that user testing um, is incredibly important, like before you even get to the journalist's point of view. Interesting. Interesting. And I, I mean, it probably comes a, a little bit about your experience of having right. reviewed thousands of products and yeah. you just know that, hey, I don't even have time to go through four screens of, of a tutorial. Right. Um, just I need it easy. Right. So right. definitely, definitely um, good. Something to think about um, for people that want to be sharing this with with anybody. Sure. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's see. I guess once, um, once you've um, deployed it um, and you've started to use it, um, are, are there any other things that you, that, that you look for? Do you um, sit down and take notes? Like, I mean, maybe if we can get really detailed into the, into the things that you do personally uh, during a review. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, I always, in addition to like having my own experience with, with an app or a product, like I also, you know, I want to know, I want to know the founder's story. I want to know, um, why they're solving the problem. Mm -hmm. I want to know, you know, why they're solving the problem in the particular way that they're trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what were the other what were the other things that they tried? What were the things that didn't work? Um, you know, what were the things that they tested out? What were, you know, hypotheses that they had um, that were wrong? You know, it, in, in a way, a lot of times that stuff is just as important. Like what gets left out or what doesn't make it into the product is just as important as what is actually in the product. Um, sure. And so being able to communicate that effectively is is kind of interesting or you know walking through the beginner's mindset of um of starting from zero starting with a hypothesis and then um you know kind of in instructing the the reporter or you know frankly quite quite frankly like any user on um you know why you believe that this is the particular way to solve this problem. Um, so I think all of those things are important. Um, and those were the things that I found interesting when I was talking to founders, when I was talking to the people that built these products um, and, and learning more about them. Does a, a does the problem that problem the product is solving trump the an interesting backstory um, about how it was produced. Um, hmm. I, I, I guess in, in the sense of a, in being newsworthy and the people right. that it would affect, right? Is it more about the problem and the people that are affected by this problem and how this will help them? Or is it more about... Well, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I mean, you know, having been like on the investing side of things um and uh i was i was at 500 startups where they had the accelerator and they had a demo day mm -hmm. um and so you know it was almost like you could have like a demo day um drinking game where um you know there's a pretty standard way to get across the message of what an app service product is um you know and and a uh, kind of standard, almost tropish uh, script for mm -hmm. getting those messages across. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it began with, you know, X is broken. Um, so we sought, <laughs> we sought to fix, you know, the problem in, in Y fashion, you know, we're the right. team to do this. Um, and so I think that that can potentially be interesting. Um, the, you know, quite frankly, like the founders that I always found were most interesting were those who had some sort of deep domain expertise, um, usually that was somewhat specialized um, that they were trying to solve for. 
right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, a, a good Some example. Some guy in the IT space for, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Better example. Yeah, no, go, go for it. <laughs> no, 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 I was gonna do a general example. You have a, you have a specific one, share. Yeah, um, so, uh, so a good example is, you know, um, somebody who is working in the legal space and uh, realized that there was an inefficiency in, um, you know, how uh, you could basically make a marketplace of independent uh, legal teams in a way that, you know, that people could get, you know, cheaper legal expertise than mm -hmm. if they went through a more specialized larger firm or whatever mm -hmm. you know stuff like that um where it's somebody who has domain expertise that has lived in the industry and looking to solve a problem um specifically for themselves or for other people that you know it might not be something that i know about um and that is part of the messaging as well is like part of it is just like educating um, a reporter like why is this a problem because mm -hmm. in many cases you know you might be solving for a problem that a reporter is never you know has never had to face themselves um, um, it might be next to impossible uh, that's if you're all kind of philosophical no, 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 no. no uh, it, it might be hard um, at at the product launch stage um, to, mm -hmm. to be able to provide a use case scenario um, to a journalist. But um, let's say you have, um, you know, you have um, some sort of um, water saving um, uh, gadget um, right. and, and you've tested this um, with, with people um, in different parts of the world and you're able to right. connect the journalist with those right. people. Would you prefer to be talking with the founder of the product or with those people that were actually helped? I mean, ultimately, I'd like to talk with all of them. I, I mean, with both of them. You know, mm -hmm. I want to talk to the founder, but I also it's important to have to have proof points um, and and to be able to, you know, I mean, I mean, reporters do diligence too, you know, mm -hmm. so like. Um, not all of them will, and some of them will be busier than others. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll just sort of take your word for it. But, you know, the really good journalists will actually say, hey, can you, can I talk to one of your customers? Can I do a, a customer referral call? And it will only usually be five or 15 minutes. Um, but, you know, we want to have that proof point. We want to have... Um, that additional like layer of information um, for a product that you know might not be something that every you know uh, every average consumer will need or want. Sure, sure. Okay, um, I have one last question, and then okay. um, we have a number of them in the in the chat. So okay. um, I was wondering if you could provide an example of a startup or a founder that did a great job of establishing an, a, re, a relationship with you or just communication um, ahead of their launch and what did they do? And mm -hmm. let's, let's remove mailbox since you okay. um, searched for them, but anybody that right. approached you and, and maybe you could tell us about that example. Sure, um, let's see. I forget the name of the product, um, but what they were essentially doing was they were providing it um, an easy way for you to do um, GoPro video editing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like basically like video editing um, in the cloud, being able to uh, shoot videos from like, you know, drones and stuff like that and be able to like immediately access it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was a founder who reached out to me. Um, I don't think that they reached out to me directly. Um, I think that they got, you know, actually, um, they got introduced by either another, um, another founder who I had written about or maybe one of their investors. Um, and, you know, this is another example of, uh, you know, kind of best practices 
is, you know, just like if, if you're a founder who has raised money, right? Like chances are you've reached out to people through um, referrals. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, reporters, they get hundreds of pitches and occasionally, you know, there will be cold emails that look particularly interesting and, but it can be hard. Like I was a person who I actually, I, I consider myself really good at email. And mm -hmm. so I actually would look at pretty much everything that came into my inbox and scan it at least. Um, occasionally I would find interesting cold pitches, but most of the time, um, you know, interesting products uh, that came my way came from investors or other entrepreneurs um, who I had gotten to know or who I had written about. Sure. And so a lot of it, you know, like lean on your referral network, lean on, you know, the network of, of people who you know um, in the same way that you would for, you know, investor outreach or whatever um, for press outreach. Um, do you, try to, uh, do you perhaps have an, an example of somebody that was um, uh, from outside the country um, or even outside Silicon Valley, right? Um, yeah, that's tough. That, and that didn't, you know, that actually were, was able to, to approach you. And, and let's just say like, really I don't tough. have a, I don't have a budget for a PR firm and, right. um, and I don't know anybody in the Valley to introduce me. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if you have a, a good example of something like that that ever happened. Yeah, that's really tough. Off the top, I don't. Um, but uh, what I will say is, you know, um, general advice for uh, cold emails or cold pitches. Um, keep it short uh, for mm -hmm. one thing. Um, make your... <laughs> make your subject line something that's easily scannable and then you know have the body of your email just three or four sentences of who you are what you do how what you do is different um and then you know follow up call to action uh do you want to learn more um because generally speaking like uh most people um, and I think this is true, not just for journalists, but most people won't read past the first paragraph if it's mm -hmm. not compelling. Um, so you just really have to like stand out in a three or four sentence, um, you know, three or four sentence uh, pitch email. Um, and, you know, basically just try to get the, the reporter's attention. Um, show that you've done research on them that, you know, show that you know you know why they're the right person to write about whatever your product is mm -hmm. um it's it 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 shows a level of you know interest and and respect it can be flattering um you know i love your reporting on on this like show that you've actually read um something that the, <laughs> that the person has written right. um you know, to stand out because so many pitch emails um, are not even remotely relevant. So if you can show your relevance, if you can show, you know, your interest, um, it's, it, it's something that you can go, go further with. Sure. And, and again, it's probably a good reminder that, Hey, I, I noticed that you wrote the, about this GPS app once. <laughs> Maybe right. you want to write about it again. Um, you want to make sure that, uh, this journalist does cover um, quite regularly, at least, or fairly regularly, uh, right. similar products, right? Yep, yep. Um, okay, um, well, let's go ahead and um, start with questions. Um, first of all, uh, Larry had a question um, about the example that you had, that you started oh, about the shred, GoPro it wasn't, it wasn't shred video, I'm like, I'm blanking on on the name, um, but I it, I know it wasn't shred video. It wasn't something that I that wasn't the particular thing. Okay, cool. All right. Well, we're gonna go uh, into the um, questions first from the questions and topics section. Then we'll jump over to the chat. Okay. So nobody panic. Um, okay. 
uh, Rudy wants to know, hi Ryan, does having a single service product or multiple service products worth telling a journalist once you have developed relationships with them or tell about the products one at a time over a period of time, build right. a better relationship. So yeah, should, should I um, tell you everything that I'm working on all at once or just one at a time? Yeah, I would, I would start with one product at a time. Um, and I mean, you know, it's generally good advice, uh, not just for pitching journalists, but also investors is, you know, um, if you're trying to tell the story of too many things at once, um, you, it looks like you lack focus. Um, mm -hmm. And it also, you know, makes people skeptical of you being able to accomplish everything that you're setting out to do. Um, so, you know, I would say focus on a single product, a single thing that you're trying to solve for. Um, you can tell them about sort of the, the big picture vision of where this thing goes um, and, and talk about that. But um, you need to get the story or the product right one thing at a time. Um, and so I would focus on, you know, I would focus on a singular product and then go from there. Perfect. Um, okay, Luke wants to ask, uh, you talk about getting access to products and apps before they launch, but the challenge for us is actually getting our app in the hands of a reporter. What mm -hmm. are the best practices for getting a reporter to agree to this? Is it simply right. developing an engaging pitch or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think we covered a lot of this mm -hmm. before, um, you know, getting, getting an app in front of a reporter, um, things that you can do. Um, you work your network, you try to find um, other things that they've written about or people that they may, that you might know, um, that they have a relationship with, um, and try to get to them that way. Um, barring that, um, you know, developing an engaging pitch um, is something that you need to work on. And at the end of the day, like you need to work on it, not just for press, but you need to be able to tell your story um, to users, you need to be able to tell your story to investors, you need to be able to tell your story to the mass market. So, you know, all of those things might be for different audiences, but generally speaking, it's usually around the same type of messaging. And so, you know, you, you'll need to get your messaging straight no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and so just trying to figure out like what the message is that is, um, appealing to that constituency which is the press versus the constituency which is your users versus constituency that is your investors um, but usually those messages are kind of a, they're usually pretty close right sure so, sure sure obviously you might not be if you're trying to pitch an investor, you want to pitch about the strengths of your company and the potential of the market, et cetera, which might not be very interesting to a potential user who wants to know about the benefits right. that for them. Right. right. Um, and, and I think that there's, um, it's good to note that, um, I mean, I personally believe there's, there's a, a press that's read by the investor class. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there's publications that are read by the investors and there's also publications that are read by tech consumers. Right. And, and journalists that cover both, right? So um, you want to make sure that you identify those and have the correct message for, for those people. Right, right. Um, all right, the next question we have um, from Ruslan is, uh, this one's a hard one. <laughs> I, would like to, <laughs> I would like to hear about hard to promote products like adult toys. Um, okay. Woo. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever had the uh, privilege of getting to test out any adult toys there, Ryan Lawler, but <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say um, it's funny. And, and you, I mean, as a reporter, you do receive those pitches. Mm -hmm. um, it's really, it's really difficult in part because that, that type of product is uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm seeing Hermione Way and Vibe has got a lot of press for for her uh, adult toy. 
mm -hmm. of IBs. Um, you know, part of it is is having the right message, and part of it is also, I mean, knowing who the audience is, um, and and trying to trying to find the right person to write about it. And um, when I say that, what I mean is that, um, you know, a lot of times um, at TechCrunch, we would receive pitches for um, startups or pitches for products or whatever. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, our mm -hmm. readers were probably not the people who, um, who was their target audience. Right. Right. Um, a good example of this is, you know, we would get a ton of, um, a ton of pitches for, you know, e-commerce products or brands or mm -hmm. whatever. And, you know, while like tech enabled commerce is interesting, you know, ultimately like the constituency that they want to be in front of is a lifestyle audience. They want, you know, people that are actually going to buy their shit. Right. And um, that might not be the readers of TechCrunch. So, right. you know, when you talk about adult toys and stuff like that, um, probably like you need to, um, find uh, the publications that actually cover that market. Um, and I think that that's true for um, any product um, because at the end of the day, like tech press might be interesting, but chances are your actual audience, your actual customers aren't going to exist, you know, just within that realm. Sure. Um, you bring up a good point and, you know, working with um, hundreds of startups um, that we've worked with that publicize, it's, it's kind of a common theme to, hey, you know, I really want to be on TechCrunch. That's like the holy grail of, of the tech world, right? And oftentimes it does not align with um, with the actual goals that the company has yeah, with of their getting, customers getting new actually. users. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And so um, some of these smaller, more niche publications, I mean, if you're, a, let's say you're a B2B um, software app um, and you need to get right. in front of a CIO, right. um, then that not necessarily you, you want to be on TechCrunch. You probably want right. to be on um, CIO or InfoWorld or, you know, right. where, where all these um, CIOs are, are reading so it, that's also a really important point and I'm glad um, I'm glad that came up yeah this is this is a conversation I, I was having with a friend of mine um, my friend Sarah who has a startup called Winnie right like you know they're basically um, they're essentially kind of like a Yelp for for children um, for places to go with your children whether it's like child-friendly restaurants or parks or you know um, around Halloween, they had, they had listings for like pumpkin patches and stuff like that. Uh -huh. um, and yes, like, you know, she's in the tech world and she's building an app, but her audience, her customers, her users are, you know, they're reading mommy blogs, you know, they're not reading TechCrunch. Um, exactly. So figure out who your audience is, figure out where your customers are, um, figure out what they're reading and target those publications. All right, exactly. And uh, Ruslan, for you, uh, Christopher Trout with Engadget often writes a lot about sex. Life, so <laughs> he might be the guy you need to reach out to. Um, let's go over to the chat section and see what other questions we have. I'm going to go from the, um, the top down. Um, Seth, we have a killer portable solar charger product, but are really struggling getting it into the hands of influential journalists. What would your strategy be to break through, start small? Only people showing interest or picking up press releases are small, sketchy websites. Any right. help would be super appreciated. Maybe we could also, um, uh, maybe I can add to this question by, by saying like, how important are these um, small tech websites or small niche websites ahead mm -hmm. of breaking out on, on, on a big mainstream publication. Um, does it have an effect on you, for example, if they've already be been covered in an yeah. industry publication, does that help you in your research to determine whether or not you wanna publish about them? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, um, what can be difficult is 
you really only get one chance to do a product launch. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you have to be very thoughtful about when that comes out. It's really difficult to, after the fact, get someone to write about you. Mm-hmm. You know, if, you, if you've issued a press release, if you've been covered on some small sites, um, and then you reach out to larger publications, it can actually be a deterrent um, in getting them interested because they look at it and they say, well, someone else has already written about this. Um, What's I'm not as interested. Right. What's new? What you, the, the question that you have to answer in that case is what's new, mm-hmm. right? What hasn't been covered before? Why is this more interesting now than it was you know, when a smaller site covered it, um, like what have you changed? How have you moved the, the story forward, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the question that you have to answer. Um, and that's what you have to be prepared for when you, um, when you pitch a publication post launch. Um, if, you, if you haven't already gotten their interest, um, sure. you have to make the, in, the story interesting again. Sure. And, and uh, Seth, pre-launch, um, there's also techniques that you can use, um, like offering an exclusive um, to a journalist um, and, and or an embargo um, if, it, if the story is big enough that it could warrant um, an embargo. Um, right. But basically what those, those two techniques are is ensuring a journalist that um, in, for the exclusive, you're ensuring a journalist that they're the only one in the world right now with this information and they reserve first right to publish um, should they like to do so. Um, and then um, you would obviously want to be reaching out to your preferred publications first with that announcement and then go down the list um, from there. And then with an embargo, um, basically, you have a, a, a long list of reporters and you say that this news, um, here's all the news you need to know and you can't write about it until this date at this time um, and, and then go ahead. And there's still, I, I'm not sure how you feel about um, getting embargoes. I know a lot of journalists um, you know, have mixed feelings about um, right. their importance and, and their relevance, but. Right, um, well, I mean, you know, on the exclusive side of things, you know, everybody wants to feel special, right? Like everybody wants to, you know, I liked writing product launches because I liked being, you know, the first person to sort of get this news out in market. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's a certain amount of pride in that. Um, the danger in, in doing that is that, you know, every time you do an exclusive for a launch or for your product or you announce in a certain publication, um, then it can potentially make it harder for you to get other publications to cover you in the future um, unless you have a differentiated story to tell. Um, With the embargo, I mean, you know, it has its place. It's, it's, it's probably the easiest way to get mass coverage. Mm -hmm. Um, The danger is that you might get more publications to write, you know, a, a worse story. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have the exclusive, generally speaking, you know, reporters will be motivated to do a better job with it mm-hmm. because, you know, they want to put your product in the best light, um, knowing that it's going to be their story about the thing that everybody reads. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's just an embargo, you're less inclined to do as good of a story um, because you know that the same thing is going to be read in six other publications potentially or a dozen other publications. Um, so, you know, that's the, those are the, the pros and cons of each, um, of each method. In both cases though, you want to be, you want to be sure to reach out, you know, generally speaking at least a week, before whenever you you want to run this story um so yeah perfect thank you um uh i know i know we're going a little bit over time so if if you if you have to leave or anything let me know we do have i have a i have a few more minutes i have about 10 more minutes okay so i can do questions all right thank you very much ryan um all right so uh uh scroby apps 
um, has a question. Is there a difference in timing for a product and an app? And uh, I think I'll try to clarify the question. Is there a difference in timing for me to deliver a, pr a physical product or an mm. app to a journalist? How much time do you require to test an app versus how much time do you require to test a physical product? I mean, it's, you know, everybody, everybody lives within their own constraints, right? Um, there are going to be people who will want to have more access to a product than others. Um, but, you know, um, we're going to work with whatever, whatever access we have, um, generally speaking. And so, you know, this is why... <laughs> This is why every time that Apple releases a new product, there's like a bunch of like two minute hands on videos that appear like from the demo pit. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, generally speaking, those are not the best um, stories for determining whether a product is going to be right for you. Um, and so, you know, I would say um, you want to have. As a journalist, you want to have as much um, access as possible. But you know, um, if if you have less uh, time to play with a hardware product um, than you would a software product, I mean, at the end of the day, you're still going to live within whatever those constraints are um, sure. and give your impressions um, based on however much time you have. Sure. Okay. Um, moving on to. Uh, Blue Chai, um, Tasty Tea Company, wants to know, how would you go about promoting a product that is new, hence has no existing market to tap into? Okay. Um, hmm. uh, well, again, I think you basically have to, you have to figure out who, who your customers are. You mm -hmm. have to figure out who your users are. Um, and you have to figure out, like, I mean, and, and not just from a press perspective, but you also have to figure this out from, you know, uh, company from a company well, perspective, from a marketing money. perspective. Right. Um, and so, you know, before you even go to press, you have to, you have to answer that question. Um, and answering that question will help inform, you know, which, which press that you pitch. Um, it'll help inform, you know, which audience you're trying to target. Um, but you have to answer that question first before, like you, um, before you start pitching the press. Okay, perfect. Um, Daniel had a question about um, how to pitch a story to a journalist if a product does not make the world a better place. <laughs> does not make the world. <laughs> it's gonna be a. It's gonna be a rough one to pitch. Um, and um, then. Um, and what if it's yeah, not a product for mass yeah, market? Good, good product, but not groundbreaking. Right. Again, I mean, um, you know, if it's if it's a niche product, you have to find out where the niche users are. Um, and and press might not be your best um, avenue of of getting them. You might have to do you know paid marketing. You might have to do um, some other like some other stuff you might have to do um influencer marketing whatever it is like um you know this is this is less about getting press and it's more about um finding your audience um finding your users and figuring out where they are um and uh finding out how to reach them and and press might not always be the way to to reach those users the or, or those customers so I'm curious yeah. as a journalist, uh, that that's how you answered that question. Maybe if you put on your, um, venture capital hat, what would mm -hmm. you say, um, to Daniel if he came with that question? I mean, is it something like, Hey, you might have to rethink what it is that you're doing or what do you No, I mean, I, I mean, you know, products can still be worthwhile and have customers and get users and whatever, even if they're not groundbreaking, but mm -hmm. Um, you just, but again, like you have to, if I'm putting the investor hat on them, I'm, I'm saying you have to figure out where they are and you have to figure out what the channels are that you're going to use 
to get in front of those users and those customers um, in the most efficient way. And you know, there's a certain amount of experimentation that you're going to have to do um, through different types of marketing channels um, and figure out what works best for you. Um, but you know, it's usually on a case-to-case, company-to-company basis. Sure. Um, that's that's actually something I wish we could have time to delve into. It's like how, right. when you're in a crowded space, um, let's say you're a productivity app and there's you know nearly a thousand <laughs> yeah, productivity yeah. apps. How do you even stand out, and and do you even need to stand out? What what's the best route for that too? But that might be I don't know. That might be something for another time. I want to make yeah. sure everybody else is um, uh, getting here. Um, can you ask a journalist you know um, for an introduction to another journalist? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and I think most journalists will recognize that um, will recognize themselves um, if they're not the right person to write about a certain thing. You know, like a good example for me when I was at TechCrunch, um, I'd occasionally get pitches for you know uh, kid tech or ed tech or parent tech or whatever. Um, I don't have kids. Uh, that's not a pain point I feel. Um, so I would pass them on to uh, Sarah Perez or someone else who had children and understood, you know, the problems that those apps or services were trying to solve better than I would. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the really strange thing would be when I would get pitches for, um, you know, for mom related products for even just like female related products. And I was like, well, you know, what am I going to do with this information? I'd pass it on to one of my female colleagues because, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to like use a bra sizing startup, you know, <laughs> just as an example, I got that pitch once. I was like, you know, this probably isn't for me, but I'll, I'll find someone else at TechCrunch to cover this. Well, that was nice of you. That was nice <laughs> of you. Pass it along for sure. Um, real quick. Last, last two questions is crowdfunding launch. Uh, a pitchable story for TechCrunch? Yeah. Um, crowdfunding is very difficult right now. Um, there was a time when, uh, you know, three or four years ago, um, when uh, there were a lot of stories for crowdfunded products. Um, I, the reason that's very difficult is, is, you know, for one thing, there are hundreds of crowdfunding campaigns that go on every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, crowdfunding could be good for a lot of things. Um, it's good for, um, it's actually good as a marketing tool um, because Kickstarter and Indiegogo have pretty robust audiences in and of themselves. Um, but it is very, very difficult to stand out from the crowd um, and the other difficult thing is, you know, I feel like after however many years of being burned by products that never actually launch after they're crowdfunded, um, reporters are a lot more skeptical about, you know, what products, um, what crowdfunded products or what crowdfunding campaigns um, they pay attention to because um, a lot of the stuff just didn't come to market or it came to market late. Um, and so, you know, it could be kind of a waste of time to write about that stuff. Right. Um, all right, we're gonna do the last question. Uh, Larry, man, I'm, I, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> we, we, gotta, we gotta let Ryan go, he has another. He wants to know more about medical research and new drugs. Yeah. Um, well, you can say that one for, uh, for another. I, I want to make sure um, Sarah's who came in first uh, is okay. answered. Um, I think the first part of your question, Sarah, how to get press for a very B2B product um, has kind of already, we've talked about it. So right. maybe you want to uh, identify who writes about similar products um, right. in the space and then identify your customer base and what they would be reading. So if it's a, C a CIO or an IT guy that makes those purchasing decisions, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you get in touch with the, a journalist that writes for those types of sites. Yeah, um, enterprise or trade press or whatever. Right. Um, 
Yeah. Right. And then how to use Twitter um, to get press for product releases. I'm not sure. Do you like getting pitches on Twitter or? Everybody's different. I mean, everyone has their preferred method of communication. Mm -hmm. um, I lived on email. Um, and so I was like one of the few journalists, I think, that actually preferred email to any other channel. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I had colleagues like my former colleague, Alex Wilhelm, um, never looked at his email um, <laughs> and did all his communication through Twitter, di Twitter DM. Um, and so, you know, it's very much a case to case basis. Um, it can be difficult to figure out which channels are best to reach um, different reporters. Um, but I will say, generally speaking, um, I think email is still the preferred method of communication and preferred way to, um, to get in touch with most people. Um, I, I, I think that there is still a bias for most reporters against trying to reach them on social channels whether it's uh, sliding into their DMs on Twitter or, um, you know, reaching out to them on Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, that can be seen, especially by some like older reporters or old school reporters as kind of icky mm -hmm. um, to be reached in places where um, they see it as more of a social environment and less about work. Um, and uh, whatever you do, don't ever, 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 uh, call a reporter that you don't know um, if you somehow are able to find their phone number um, because you know that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of like the creepiest uh, sure. way to to get in touch with them sure sure okay great all right Ryan well um, thank you very much for sharing everything with us and answering all these questions and staying yep. um, over time. Really appreciate it and hope to have you back um, one day and we can talk about another subject. Um, okay. Uh, I want to let everybody know, um, please go ahead and uh, visit the ratchet uh, to hear great tech tales and <laughs> also uh, visit publicize.co to learn more about uh, PR for startups. Uh, if you have any specific questions, you can email me at uh, jim at publicize.co. And we'll also, like I said before, uh, be putting this up on the YouTube channel um, so you can go back and reference. Um, and that's Publicize Team is the name of the YouTube channel. So I appreciate everybody who took the time out of their day to come here too. Um, that's, that's really huge. And um, until next time, appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Take care.